A young couple named Alexandra Canova and Antonin Christian had always desired a big family. When Alexandra, who believed she was expecting twins, learned a startling truth during an ultrasound, their plans took an unexpected turn. Though life had other ideas, they had hoped to have more time to get ready for growing their family. It was clear as Alexandra's pregnancy developed that the initial theory of twins was untrue. Though she had assumed her second pregnancy would be easy, Alexandra's visit to the doctor brought shocking news. With odds larger than one in a million, the ultrasound data presented a rare occurrence that was unprecedented in the nation. Although Alexandra and Antonin's families had a history of twins, the later disclosure revealed unexpected details. While rumors swirled, Alexandra's concerns grew as she considered all of the possible outcomes of her pregnancy, including the unexpected ultrasound results. Alexandra had dreamed of a future with her first child and her devoted lover, Antonin, at the tender age of 23. They had worked hard to make sure they could support more children since they were eager to start a larger family. Because of her mother and their close bond, Alexandra wanted to be just like her, a loving mother. She was ecstatic to learn she was pregnant a second time and was eager to grow their family even more. She felt a deep happiness within herself, knowing that her spouse would too. But Alexandra knew that the next few months would be stressful as they got their house and habits ready for a new baby. She had no idea how big of a task lay ahead of her. Given that Alexandra was a great mother to her small kid, her family felt confident that she could also raise her second child. The pregnant woman found the waiting period exciting, planning baby names, buying little shoes, and decorating her house to welcome her new family members. At first, Czech couple Alexandra Canova and Antonin Croson were thrilled to hear they were expecting a child. They had no idea, though, what life had in store for them. With her prior experience as a mother, Alexandra, who was 23 at the time, showed no concern even after learning they were expecting multiple children. First-time mothers may find the childbirth process unsettling, but after having one kid, regular doctor visits became usual. But there were more shocks in store for her in life. The only information obtained from the first ultrasound was that Alexandra was indeed pregnant. Although her health was good, the results of the next ultrasound would be more detailed. Alexandra's baby bulge expanded quickly, as is common with twin moms. Over the next few weeks, the physicians were able to locate the heartbeat and made a happy discovery that surprised everyone. Both Alexandra and Antonin were shocked to find out during the ensuing scan that she was pregnant twins. It was evident how happy they were to be expecting three children rather than two. But their presumptions were incorrect. Even though the couple was in their early twenties and had experience as parents, they were met with unexpected responses from people in their immediate vicinity who voiced worries about their readiness for the future child. The couple started making plans for twins in the ensuing months, buying furnishings and baby outfits. They had no idea what a big surprise was in store for them, one that would defy everyone's assumptions about their level of preparedness for the growing family. After successfully raising their kid, the couple were confident in their abilities to handle twins, but they soon realized they might be in over their heads. The pair was anxious at first, but they soon saw how important it was to treasure this moment. Everyone was excited, friends, family, even complete strangers, making a big deal out of what they thought was a typical pregnancy. Canova's doctors did not realize how unusual their experience was until they presented the results of an ultrasound. Canova didn't realize the unusual nature of her pregnancy as the months went by between examinations, nor that it would soon make headlines throughout the world. They didn't find it all that strange that someone would have twins. But as the pregnancy went on, Canova became aware of a problem. She told herself that everything would be all right until the next checkup, but she nevertheless looked forward to seeing the doctor every time. When the medical team saw Canova again, after looking over his records, they seemed confused. They decided to perform another ultrasound in an attempt to solve the issue because of something in her past. The doctor's expectations were beyond Canova's husband, who had been a rock star during her first pregnancy and had attended every appointment. He had no idea that there would be additional difficulties ahead. 
Canova and her partner had already prepared for the unexpected moments of parenting by stockpiling diapers and baby formula, childproofing their home, and acquiring the essential baby supplies. They also bought sturdy strollers for use on family vacations. However, questions remained about their level of preparedness for Canova's imminent delivery and if they had enough supplies. Canova maintained her confidence in the face of worries from her doctor and spouse because she felt that her regular prenatal vitamin consumption and strict self-care would protect her unborn children. But the doctor's look suggested a different story. Canova saw doctors whispering to each other and glancing at her worriedly as she entered a hospital room for her checkup, which made her worry even more about her health. Canova was nervous, seeing the obvious discomfort in the physician's looks, and she would soon realize how deeply worried they were when she left the clinic that day. Originally intended to be a standard treatment for expectant women, Canova's ultrasound took an unexpected turn when her doctors voiced alarm on the enormous growth of her stomach in only a few months of pregnancy. The couple was really uncomfortable after learning this. When Canova learned she wasn't carrying twins, she instantly expected the worst, thinking one of the babies would have lost life in pregnancy, as happens frequently with multiple births. But the truth was even more confusing. And why wouldn't she have been expecting twins? Is it some kind of weird tumor that has developed really quickly? It found out that the response was something that had not been seen in almost 500 years. Canova's concerns for her health and the health of her unborn children increased as a result of the lack of definitive answers. She had been trying hard to lead a healthy lifestyle ever since finding out she was pregnant, but the idea of losing her babies made her cry. Even for someone expecting twins or triplets, Canova's pregnancy wasn't typical, as the physicians could see from one look at her stomach. Although the scan sparked questions, a clear explanation eluded them. Although it was clear that Canova was expecting more children than she had originally believed, the precise number proved difficult to determine because of the intricate arrangement of several kids inside the womb. Specifics were unavailable from the doctors, even at this point in the pregnancy. When Canova learned that she wasn't expecting twins, the uncertainty caused a moment of heartbreaking sadness. Thankfully, she was still pregnant, but when the real tale came to light, it shocked her. No reproductive procedures were used, but Canova was also not carrying triplets. There was confusion because the signs seemed to indicate otherwise. How many children was she really having, I wondered. Canova was unconcerned even though the physicians were unable to pinpoint the precise number of babies. She had a healthy kid of her own and was aware of the warning signals of pregnancy difficulties, but she had only had morning sickness for a few weeks at this point. Canova and the medical staff were both confused about the exact nature of her pregnancy and fascinated by this extraordinary circumstance due to the mystery surrounding it. No matter how many children she might have, she was sure they would all grow up to be quite healthy. Still, the couple was understandably astonished to learn she was expecting quadruplets when the doctors verified it. Initially, they had only planned on having two children. It was unexpected to learn that they will have five kids in all, including their current youngster. They had just about recovered from the shocks when another shocking discovery was made. Imagine how tough it would be to expect four infants instead of two. While most couples might find it distressing to learn they are having twins instead of a single baby. The mother's nine-month journey was filled of surprises, but the couple handled the news with grace. Even though they hurried to get items for the two unexpected extra infants, a subsequent scan revealed an unexpected development. Uncertain of what to anticipate, she had another ultrasound performed before her due date, just like any other expectant woman would. She was ready for any outcome, even though she was ready for the burden of raising four children. Even though she was stressed, she knew that she and her boyfriend, along with her mother, could make a joyful home for however many children ended up being born. After learning that they were expecting four babies at first, an ultrasound a few months later revealed a fifth baby, quintuplets, in utero. One issue emerged, why hadn't the medical professionals seen this sooner? It was understandable for the family to grow anxious about the couple's ability to raise the kids as well as the doctor's negligence. Canova's mother was shocked to hear of the unexpected number of babies. 
She doubted whether she could trust the physicians to deliver each baby safely and whether they would provide enough support. The last several months of Canova's pregnancy, when pregnant moms usually feel tranquil before labor, were severely impacted by the stress. Most expectant parents usually feel ready to start their new lives with their child after nine months of getting ready for their baby. But right before their kids were born, Canova and her partner were under greater stress than ever. Their anxiousness was heightened by questions about whether they were indeed expecting five babies and worries about the prospect of more. Regretfully, the couple had no choice but to wait for Canova's delivery date following the last doctor's appointment. The physicians arranged a caesarean section because the young mother's due date was approaching and they wanted to make sure she was comfortable and reduce the possibility of difficulties throughout the childbirth procedure. The five babies had been hard to find previously because there were so many of them in Canova's belly and they moved all the time, making it hard to get a good scan. There was also the additional uncertainty about the possibility of a sixth child. Canova was excited to find out the baby's gender so she could plan their clothing even though she wasn't anticipating sextuplets. But the sheer volume of infants meant that doctors could not prenatally ascertain the genders. This was knowledge that the couple had to wait patiently to learn after the babies were delivered. Forty people, including a cameraman and medical personnel, were in the room ready to safeguard the safety of the mother and quintuplets as Canova went into labor. The hospital had never handled a multiple delivery with that many infants, so this incredible amount of assistance was vital. Only immediate family members could attend the birth due to the operating room's small size. Two nurses checked on each newborn right away to make sure they were healthy and to take their vital signs. The medical team needed to evaluate each kid as soon as possible because multiple births can present health risks. In order to reduce the possibility of any birth issues and ensure the safety of the mother and all of her babies, the decision was made to deliver the baby by caesarean section, which was planned ahead of time and supervised by multiple specialists. This preventive measure became essential when considering the uncertainties that resulted from the multiple ultrasounds. There was doubt among many in attendance, including some doctors, regarding Canova's veracity in expecting only five children. Regardless of the number of babies, the family was relieved and appreciative that all of them were born without any problems when the delivery procedure was finished. There were ultimately five newborns, all of whom received professional treatment from the hospital's medical team. Every baby needed care after birth, with the youngest needing special attention. Canova and her five new infants left the hospital after a few days of recuperation to start their family life. The chief medical doctor of the neonatal unit reported that the births went smoothly and were a great joy for the couple. The moms of the couple not only helped bring the babies out of the hospital but also spent the next few weeks with the new parents at their house, helping to look after their grandkids. Because of the national news coverage of the births, they also applied for government aid for the grandchildren. Even though the family received a lot of attention from around the world, Canova's main concern was for her children's well-being. One in several million women will naturally conceive and give birth to quintuplets, which is an incredibly rare occurrence. Nonetheless, the family was able to obtain some much-needed government support because to the media publicity, Canova could judge whether her family was ready to raise all of the children after bringing them home. Even though parenting several newborns was difficult, the media attention helped the government provide support. With a girl named Tereska and four boys, Daniel, Michael, Alex, and Martin, Canova and Christian were ecstatic with their new family. Canova had no idea that her family had shattered a local record. After the occurrence, Alina Makarova, one of the obstetricians present at the birth, did some investigation and found that the family had created local history on the day the quintuplets were born. Makarova emphasized in an interview with The Telegraph that birth data have been kept track of in the Czech Republic since 1949. There were doubts regarding whether Canova was the first mother in the area to accomplish such a feat after it was revealed that she had given birth to quintuplets. It turns out that quintuplets are incredibly uncommon in the Czech Republic, occurring only once every 480 years on average. The probability of naturally producing quadruplets is 1 in 7 million, which heightens the interest. Around the world, 
quintuplets are typically born as a result of in vitro fertilization and other fertility therapies. Canova's situation was distinct, though, as she gave birth naturally, which raised the possibility that her family's genetic background had something to do with the enigma surrounding her many births. Quintuplets are extremely rare, Canova and her partner, Crosgen, mentioned that twins run in both of their families naturally. Taking care of one child can be difficult enough, but managing five can be draining. Worldwide donations were received by the couple, and significant assistance in caring for the infants was provided by friends and family. Now that their family had made history, they could look forward to a long and happy future together. Upon learning of the quintuplet's birth, people from all around the world kindly donated to show their support. But getting these monies was difficult because the government had previously promised to help, even with a nanny. Unfortunately, this assistance proved insufficient to take care of the household's six small children. Government requests for more aid were turned down, not because the government wasn't prepared to help, but rather because Canova's family's circumstances were unique to the system. The Ministry of Social Affairs in the Czech Republic acknowledged that their system was not ready for so many lucky breaks. Canova acknowledged her satisfaction at raising her children in spite of the challenges. Five cakes are served on each child's birthday, and friends are welcome to join in the festivities. Even if raising five children might seem like a lot, Canova and her spouse have shown that anything is achievable. Even five years after the miraculous birth, the babies continue to beat the odds every day, despite the medical consultants predicted 95% likelihood of them growing up healthy. Canova has accepted parenthood with unwavering resilience. Her situation's uniqueness acts as a strong motivator. There is an astounding 1 in 48 million probability of naturally conceiving quintuplets during a pregnancy. There are about 800 quintuplets in the world, more than 130 of them spontaneously conceived. Canova never would have imagined the joy her children bring to her life, even after years of learning she was expecting quintuplets. Still, one thing is for sure, she doesn't want any more kids. That's all about the first story, now let's watch another similar story. Rob has had a lot of bad things happen to him lately. He hasn't experienced the common belief that a black streak is followed by a white one. Things started to go wrong for Rob about a year ago. He had a steady employment for 10 years as a driver for a motor transport firm at first. But under the pretense of optimization, a new manager implemented adjustments that rendered Rob and a number of other drivers jobless. He kept looking for a new job, but other people always got ahead of him. Rob began his career as a cab driver in response. Despite having a constant flow of customers, he had to put in long hours because there were too many cab drivers in the market. Rob's wife Amber wasn't happy with this arrangement because they didn't have a lot of money and Rob was always traveling. She liked Rob despite her sporadic whining and tears. Luckily, Amber had a steady work as a shop clerk. Rob wanted to start a family, upgrade their flat, and shower his wife with gifts since he realized how unusual their circumstances were. Planning for the future was difficult, though, because of his financial situation's ongoing uncertainty. One day, Rob was standing at the station waiting for orders when she saw an old woman in threadbare clothes asking for a lift to the graveyard. Rob reluctantly agreed to take her despite the unusual request and the late hour, taking the boss's decisions into consideration. Amber called multiple times during the voyage to stress their shortage of groceries at home, their financial worries, and the necessity to pay for a washing machine. In the face of these obstacles, Rob limply gave her the assurance that he would manage everything, even as the strain of their trying situation weighed heavily on him. As his melancholy grew, he became enraged and even yelled at the quiet passenger in the back seat. It was becoming late, and it was a long walk to the cemetery. Rob was baffled as to why the old woman insisted on going there even though he knew he would have to wait. Fifty dollars, Rob said, expressing the fare, and the old lady gave him two hundred dollar bills. This is excessive, Rob protested. The old woman calmly said, understanding his troubles, take it all. You're a good man, and you need it more than I do. She rebuffed Rob's offer to wait and drive her back to town, 
saying she could handle things on her own. Rob was worried about the winter night, but the woman was determined. She murmured, don't worry, they'll come for me, and blessed Rob as she opened the car door and made her way to the cemetery. Rob watched her walk away, perplexed, but then received a call from a regular client in need of immediate transportation. His attitude lifted considerably as he drove around for the next hour, making good journeys. He was in shock when he eventually had a chance to count the money. The old woman gave her several bills, but these were joker souvenir bills, not actual cash. Rob had been tense and preoccupied at first and hadn't noticed. Rob was incensed and felt duped, he couldn't believe he had been taken in. His mind went back to the elderly lady and her apparent susceptibility in the chilly graveyard. Rob knew how stupid he was, yet he couldn't let it go. Driven by rage, he made the unlikely decision to visit the graveyard in the unlikely event that she was still there. By the time Rob reached the cemetery in the dark, his feelings had subsided a little. Shaking his head, he wondered why he had come. Likely, the woman had departed as she had promised. Rob was about to head back when he saw something moving in the moonlight next to the cross, not far behind the gate. Thoughts of outlandish assumptions filled his thoughts despite the involuntary goosebumps. Stories from childhood about the interacting with the living and ghosts returned. Rob wondered if the old woman was a ghost, someone who had passed away. He dismissed these ideas and chastised himself for giving in to such ridiculous anxieties. He should not be terrified of scary stories as an adult. Rob thought of other sensible explanations, such as the possibility that the old lady was sitting on her family graves and was mentally ill or that she just didn't know what genuine money looked like. If she froze, he worried so much that he may be unintentionally the cause of her passing away. These arguments persuaded Rob, who resolutely abandoned his car and made his way towards the cemetery in the starry, peaceful night. Rob strolled up the narrow road, its light from the murky moonlight cast in shadows where he had previously observed activity. A wave of indecision overcame him when he saw tracks in a deep drift of snow that had broken from the trail. The old woman had come through here before, but she was gone now. Rob was frustrated and silently cursed, wondering where she had disappeared to. When the moon rose above the clouds, the cemetery was bathed in yellow light and the old lady sitting fifty meters distant, draped in snow, was visible against a monument. She turned, squinting hopelessly to try to see who was calling while Rob yelled at her. The elderly woman shuddered, frozen and barely able to move, as Rob drew near. Rob wading through the heavy snow drift to get to her was both angry and worried. He put his hand on her shoulder and saw that she was still. Rob was not enraged with her for her earlier deceit. His annoyance gave way to pity as he read the inscription on the stone, which identified the grave as belonging to a forty-year-old lady, possibly the elderly woman's daughter or a relative. I apologize, but you still owe me. You're not going to the grave for nothing, Rob remarked, recognizing the terrible events that had caused the elderly woman to freeze in the graveyard. The old woman was silent but shook, tears flowing down her cheeks, before they lifted her up and dragged her across the snowdrift to the automobile. Rob handed her a sip after pouring some hot tea from a thermos once they were in the car. Five minutes or so later, the woman started to feel a little better. She said, Why did you come here? I told you not to. Are you kidding? Smiled Rob. First of all, I couldn't get it out of my head that I left an old woman in the cold at the cemetery. And secondly, you deceived me. Yes, I'm sorry, she said quietly. But no one was going to come for me, and I decided to stay here next to my daughter. You mean to freeze? Rob asked with a stern clarification. The old woman nodded, lowering her eyes. Rob questioned in shock, what happened in your life that made you decide to do something like that? But no, by deceit, I meant something else. You deceived me in another way. You gave me fake money. The old woman shrieked, what fake money? It can't be. The director himself gave it to me. You must have gotten something wrong. I gave you the money out of the goodness of my heart, even more than you asked. 
Rob became irate and asked, Really? Out of the goodness of your heart? That's it, enough. Let's go to the police. Let them deal with you there. No, it's not the police, the elderly woman sobbed. They'll take me back to the nursing home again, and I can't stay there. It's better to leave me here. I want to leave the world and be next to my daughter. I'm ready for that. And I want that. As for the money, I'm sorry if I cheated. It's not out of malice. Here, take this. It's not expensive, but it's still worth something. She took a silver chain with a pendant in the shape of an angel out of her pocket. This belonged to my daughter Judith, the woman murmured, blotting her tears. I gave it to her when she was in school. I found it after her passing away, and it's been with me ever since. But now, I don't need it. With tears running down her face, her fingers trembled as she held out the chain. Rob experienced a stab to the chest. The old woman didn't appear to be lying. Put the chain back in your pocket, he instructed. Let it be with you, and forget about the money. I believe you didn't mean to deceive me. Probably you yourself have been a victim of deceit. Tell me about yourself. What's your name? With a composed response, my name is Margaret Collins, the woman clasped the necklace and held it against her chest. After my daughter and son-in-law passed away, I've been living in a nursing home, but it was unbearable there, so I decided to take matters into my own hands. With a contemplative glance at Mrs. Collins, Rob questioned, why was it so unbearable in the nursing home? With a sorrowful shake of her head, Mrs. Collins started telling her tale. Her entire life, she had resided in the community. Her daughter Judith was reared by her alone after her young husband passed away. Judith, a stunning and educated woman, met her future husband in the city after graduating from college. After they were eventually married, Mrs. Collins prayed for happiness in her daughter's home each day. Though disappointed not to be able to conceive, Judith and Mark had a happy life together. The notion that they existed solely for one another became second nature to them. Mrs. Collins's daughter took her to live with them in the city as her health deteriorated. Nothing was out of the ordinary for two years. But tragedy happened when they were on vacation. Many people, including Judith and Mark, perished when the bus they were riding in plunged down a ravine along a winding road. Even though it was painful and unpleasant, Mrs. Collins was able to hold herself together and bury them personally. She had lost all strength after the funeral when a small child showed up claiming to be Mark's daughter and claiming ownership of the flat. Mrs. Collins let the daughter have it, she looked a lot like her late son-in-law. It transpired that Mark's will reveal disagreements between him and Mrs. Collins's daughter. Judith's knowledge of his illegitimate daughter remained unknown. With no other choice, Mrs. Collins chose to enter the nursing home. She quickly discovered, nonetheless, that the assisted living facility, officially known as a house of mercy, was actually nothing more than a jail. The residents received subpar food, the cheapest medications, and rigorous walking schedules. In addition, living expenses took up 75% of their pensions. The director, who was said to have been a chief in the jail system and who managed the nursing home like a prison, terrified the elderly inhabitants. Mrs. Collins regretted accepting to stay in the nursing home since she found it difficult to adjust to life there. When the director, Mr. Bennett, learned of her desire for a transfer, he frightened her. She encountered resistance from him. All of a sudden, Mr. Bennett showed an interest in the funds that the tenants had saved from the quarter of their pensions that they had paid him. He proposed that everything be traded in for big bills, saying that the elderly would be safer that way. Mrs. Collins accepted false banknotes without questioning their authenticity. Mrs. Collins, who had no family and nowhere to spend her money, was deeply depressed and wondered what the point of her life was. The tipping point was the passing of her buddy, who was not given proper treatment during a medical emergency. Mrs. Collins was forced to reflect on her own life after this incident and asked herself why she kept waiting to lost life in a cage. The senior residents were cautioned not to file complaints the morning of the nursing home inspection. 
They put on a front of contentment for the inspectors by being well-groomed, appropriately attired, and let to watch TV in the hallway. Mrs. Collins sat in the hall, feeling powerless and desperate to get away, but she had no idea where to go and no warm clothes for the winter outside. Taking advantage of the situation, Mrs. Collins witnessed an employee remove her scarf and jacket at the door, leaving the old people alone for a bit. Seizing the opportunity, Mrs. Collins snatched up the woman's clothing and fled outside. She ran to a nearby bus stop and put on the shawl and down jacket. Maybe blessing her escape, several elderly folks looked from the window. Fortuitously, a shuttle bus showed up on time, and Mrs. Collins got on it without giving the destination a second thought, as long as it was far away. She paid the fare, found cash in her sweater's hidden pocket, and made her way to the train station. Mrs. Collins didn't know if anyone was trying to find her. They most likely kept it quiet right away to save face in front of the inspectors. Lost in contemplation, Mrs. Collins strolled around the station. Her imagination replayed the image of her daughter calling. She swiftly located her daughter's grave in a cab at the cemetery, embraced the gravestone, and sat there, waiting for what she thought would be the end. At the conclusion of her story, Mrs. Collins murmured to Rob, I'm sorry, dear. I gave you the money out of the goodness of my heart, and I didn't know that they were fake. I've already understood, Rob muttered back, thinking things over. Now, what ought he to do? It seemed sensible to call the police, but he was hesitant because he thought they might send the old lady back to the assisted living facility. What if she was punished for her escape? Rob refused to listen to Mrs. Collins' suggestion to see her daughter again. Fearing for her life, he shut the doors. Okay, but then I'll blame myself for the passing away of a woman for the rest of my life. That's not fair to me. Okay, it's decided. You're coming with me. Mrs. Collins whispered, terrified, where to? To my house. You'll rest and come to your senses, and in the morning, will decide where to complain. This felt like the proper choice, thus it was made on its own. Rob had planned to have Mrs. Collins stay the night at his house and then make a police call first thing in the morning. He insisted that she be put in a licensed nursing home before he would allow her to leave. Mrs. Collins inquired about his wife, fearing for her reaction. Rob comforted her, telling her that Amber would get the situation. Amber was offended at first, but in the end she consented to allow Mrs. Collins stay the night. Mrs. Collins sensed that she was not welcome in the hallway. As this was going on, Amber called out to her from the kitchen, requesting that she remove her outer garments and join them for tea. Mrs. Collins obeyed reluctantly, and Amber let out a scream of recognition as she did. Mrs. Collins, is that you? Don't you recognize me? It's Amber, Amber Gibson. Are you Helen and Ben's daughter from our village? Rob suddenly realized when Amber nodded. Mrs. Collins had lived next door to Amber's parents and was from the same village as his wife. Their unanticipated bond broke the ice and helped them communicate with each other in a way they had never done before. Mrs. Collins was cordially received by Amber into their house, where she was given comfort, a drink, and help taking a shower. She made the old woman's living room her temporary home. Then Amber called the parents of Mrs. Collins in the hamlet and told them about the struggles their neighbor had faced. When Mrs. Collins's parents heard about her ordeal, they asked Rob to take her to the village right away. There were a few sturdy, unoccupied houses in the village, even if Mrs. Collins's house had new owners. The neighborhood came together to support her during her transition, giving her support over the summer. Mrs. Collins approved of the plan. Rob drove her to the village after Amber told her about her parents' offer in the morning. Mrs. Collins described the abuses she had encountered in the assisted living facility before calling the police. A thorough prosecutor's audit of the nursing facility that followed turned up a number of infractions and offenses. The director was imprisoned after it was discovered throughout the investigation that he had participated in the elder abuse. There have been major staff changes at the nursing home, and the older inhabitants now live reasonably, free from the anxieties of their past. 
Mrs. Collins declined to go back to the assisted living facility. In her home village, she was happy. For Rob, his run of bad luck has finally come to a stop. Rob once gave a ride to Mr. Garrison, who appreciated Rob's safe driving and courteous driving manners. Mr. Garrison was so impressed that he offered Rob a position as a personal driver, paying three times as much as a taxi driver would. Rob embraced the offer with gusto. Rob's life has taken a turn for the better, and he and Amber are now content and looking forward to having a baby. The hard times are behind us, which emphasizes how crucial it is to let go of grudges during trying times. They kept their hearts open, and ultimately good fortune smiled upon them.